the discussion we're having tonight could not be happening at a more important time. Over the last few weeks, we have seen the most brutal assault by Israel on Palestinians uh, in Gaza, in the West Bank and in Israel itself. But also, crucially, we have seen the most inspiring resistance by Palestinians themselves. And here in Britain, we obviously have to join the protests. We have to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians. We have to stand against Israeli apartheid. But we also, I think, have to understand what is happening. We have to understand the politics behind the situation we see unfolding in Palestine. We have to understand the players, the, 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 the reasons this is taking place in order to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians. And I think to understand what, what is happening, I think there are three main things that we have to consider. I think the first thing is, is that despite all the odds, despite the terrible, hellish situation they find themselves in, the Palestinian people continue to resist. And they resist in a heroic and a brave and an inspiring way. Every time uh, the news, the media, you know, world politics forgets about Palestine, every time the headlines move away from it, the Palestinian people surprise us by their ability to resist. And it is worth thinking about the kind of resistance we have seen over the last three or four weeks, especially in Gaza, but also elsewhere. Think about the resistance that we've seen of the protests that came out in response to Sheikh Jarrah, the neighbourhood in East Jerusalem being ethnically cleansed by Israel. Think about the tens of thousands of people who flocked to Al-Aqsa Mosque, who protested across the West Bank and across Gaza in opposition to this historic neighbourhood being evicted. Think about the brave resistance we've seen inside historic Palestine, what you know, what is now called the Israeli state, in some of the cities uh, like Lod, like Ramla, in places where it is banned to even fly the Palestinian flags. You've seen Palestinians bravely taken to the streets, facing Israeli mobs, facing the police, facing the army, the you know, down facing down the barrel of guns to protest inside Israel itself. And think about the scenes that we saw yesterday where you had a, a general strike called uh, to stand in solidarity with Palestine. So across the West Bank, across Gaza, and crucially in, in, in some industries where Palestinians work in Israel, there's two million Palestinians who live in Israel, you saw people uh, walking out, trying to escalate the struggle, trying to hit back economically about uh, against the Israeli regime. All of this resistance is incredibly important because if you look at the narrative in the mainstream media, much of the narrative focuses on the, uh, well, what they call a conflict between Hamas and the Israeli state. Uh, and it's worth saying this isn't a conflict. This is a brutal war where you have Israel armed to the hilt by uh, imperialism by you know the US by Britain and so on and you have Hamas fighting back with whatever rockets they can lay their hands on it's not a, a a conflict but much of the mainstream media focuses on that but what I think we have to appreciate is that what we are seeing in Palestine at the moment is a popular uprising there is a it is not just about the military battle it is about the popular uprising that we have seen on the streets. We have seen mass protests on a scale I don't think we've seen in a long, long time. It's still early days, but the revolt has a feel of the 1987 Intifada and of the one in 2000. So I think when we're trying to assess what is happening on the ground, we have to recognise that Palestinian people have agency and it is their resistance that has made the world pay attention to what is happening in the region. So that's the first thing I think we have to think about. I think the second thing we have to think about is that the brutality of the Israeli state has been laid bare over the last seven to 10 days. Israel has launched what many experts believe to be an assault that is three times as big as the last one we saw in 2014. 
We've seen the destruction of Gaza, one of the most densely populated regions on Earth. We've seen a death toll reaching hundreds, many of whom are children. We've seen the bombing of media buildings, of schools, of hospitals. We have seen the most brutal Israeli force. The, the images that you see on the news make a mockery of the idea that this is a battle between two even sides. But we've also seen more fundamental things than that. We have seen the unleashing of right-wing mobs essentially uh, patrolling the streets with the aim of lynching some of the Palestinians who live in Israel. The two million, uh, well, they're called Arab Israelis, but in reality, they have no, uh, no real citizenship, citizenship or rights compared to the Israeli citizens, egged on by people in Netanyahu's government, egged on, egged on by government ministers, given the cover to attack Palestinians, to drag them out of their cars, to beat them, and so on. This is a new feature, I think. It's existed in the past, but this is a recent feature where you have a Netanyahu regime who has moved so far to the right that is actively giving cover to and encouraging these, these people. You've also seen, I think, the... Uh, let what has been laid bare is you've seen what ethnic cleansing look, looks like. And that neighbourhood in Sheikh Jarrah, in East Jerusalem, is an indicator of that. And we should remember, when we're talking about Sheikh Jarrah, that at one point, every city, every neighbourhood in Israel was Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, before 1948, it was Palestinians who lived in all the cities and, and you know, in all the land across Palestine. In 1948, the Nakba, which Saturday marked the 73rd anniversary of, saw the mass expulsion of 750,000 people forced from their homes. And since then, Israel has launched a campaign of ethnic cleansing in, in, in Palestine and forced home after home, neighborhood after neighborhood, town after town out of their homes and with no right to return, no refugee status and so on. So the last two weeks has laid bare the real nature of the Israeli state. There is a question to be raised, which is whether what Israel is doing at the moment fits with the recent patterns that we've seen in terms of how to deal with the Palestinian question. Um, over the last 30 or 40 years, the Israeli strategy has been what the government ministers have referred to as cutting the grass, a horrific term, which which they what what they mean by it is that every five or six years they will bomb Gaza, they will attack uh, Palestinians in Israel, they will encroach on more land in an effort to root out the most militant sections of the Palestinian resistance. There is a question because of the nature of the Netanyahu regime about whether the current campaign goes beyond that, about whether the right wing forces uh, within Netanyahu's cabinet within his government are really off the leash. Uh, we know that there's people, the Kahanists and so on, who have, you know, referenced exterminating Palestinians, exterminating Arabs. There are some in his government who clearly would want to do that. And while we can appreciate there will be questions raised about whether that's happening, in reality, I think what the last two weeks shows us is that the ethnic cleansing, the apartheid, uh, the occupation of Palestinian land is not about whether there's a right-wing prime minister in charge of Israel. It's not about how right-wing Netanyahu is. It flows from the logic of the Israeli state. The settler colonial project, which displaced Palestinians in the Nakba, the racist apartheid regime, which treats Palestinians and second-class citizens. I think you have seen that on display for the world to see over the last two weeks. So I think that's the second thing we have to understand is that the true nature of the Israeli regime has been exposed because of recent events. The third thing I think we have to understand is the importance of the international context. Um, and this is very important because traditionally, Israeli prime ministers have pursued a strategy which is, well, which has usually been referred to the inside-out strategy. And what they mean by the inside-out strategy 
is that first, Israel has to deal with what they call the Palestinian problem. And once it deals with that problem and gets that under control, then it allows Israel to get on board some of the external international players, you know, sign treaties, make allies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Netanyahu, with the help of Trump, broke with that strategy uh, about five years ago. And he pursued what was called an outside-in strategy. Uh, and the outside-in strategy said that he would use the international weight of international treaties, international support, and so on, use it to try and crush the Palestinian question. Uh, that he would deal with the big international outside first to deal with the problems within what he calls Israel. Because of the actions of Palestinians over the last two weeks, about and longer, that plan now lies in tatters. Because of the actions of Palestinians, Netanyahu, Netanyahu's whole plan about preserving Israel as a democracy, which you know doesn't have to deal with the Palestinian question anymore, that now lies in tatters. And now the world is watching. And we have exposed, it has exposed the so-called progressive agenda of people like Joe Biden. Uh, when Joe Biden came to office, much of the left, I think, were quite disorientated by his uh, so-called progressive domestic strategy, his talk around climate change and so on. Joe Biden has shown what he really stands for in the last week, offering full support to Netanyahu and offering full support to Israel in terms of dropping bombs. So I think the third thing we have to appreciate is how the international community gives cover to what Israel does. And that when Israel attacks Gaza, when the force of the, uh, the brutality of the Israeli, Israeli state is exposed, you get to see the real uh, story when it comes to the so-called humanitarian concerns and the so-called interests of international powers. What does this all mean for us? What do those three things mean for us here in Britain? Because we know that the British relationship to Palestine is a unique one. And we know that right since the, uh, ever since the Balfour Declaration of 1917, that Britain has played a key role in sustaining Zionist, the Zionist settler colonial project in Israel. We know that in the last five years alone, there's been 400 million pounds worth of arms sales from Britain to Israel. And I think the recent events of the last week are incredibly important for us here in Britain as well. Because to be honest, over the last four or five years, the pro-Palestine movement in this country has, if we're honest, taken a bit of a battering from the right. Uh, in truth, we have seen big gains made against the movement in solidarity with Palestine here in Britain. And at the heart of that was a concerted effort to conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism. Now, of course, any instance of anti-Semitism must be opposed, but we know that that campaign against Jeremy Corbyn, against the left, against socialists, against the Palestine movement was about Palestine. It was an attempt to try and silence and to try and stop criticism of the Israeli state uh, and its actions. And the impact of that, I think, was quite big in Britain over the last few years. It has led to an atmosphere where it's been hard to speak out on the question of Palestine. Uh, think about the, diff the difficulties faced by Palestine societies on campus. Think about the difficulty in trade unions or in the Labour Party. And a lot of it was focused in the Labour Party against Corbyn, who's no longer a Labour MP still, against his supporters and so on. I think the mobilisations we've seen in this country over the last week are an opportunity to begin to roll back some of the gains the supporters of, of Israel have made in this country. I think there is an opportunity to roll back some of those gains and to begin also to start raising questions of support for Palestine, support for the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, the criticism of Israel more loudly than we have been able to in the last four or five years. You think about the demonstration we saw on Saturday in London of 100,000 people, and I know there was one in Manchester. You think about the news coming out today of school students revolting, walking out of some of their colleges across Britain in solidarity with uh, 
Palestine, there exists a huge opportunity for us to reinvigorate Palestine solidarity in this country. And I think it's crucial that we do that. I also think, and I'll finish on this point, Archie, I also think that in all of this, while we point to what Israel's doing, while we raise solidarity with Palestine, while we march on Saturday, while we continue and try and build the movement in support, I think it's crucial we say that the question of politics matters when it comes to Palestine. If we have learned anything over the last two weeks, it is that Israel is an apartheid regime with ethnic cleansing, terror, and discrimination towards Palestine built into its DNA. And as a result of that, we have to say that the Palestinians through their uprising have shown that the two-state solution is no solution. That the two-state solution that has been pursued since the Oslo Accords over 20, 30 years ago, that that two-state solution has really given Israel cover to continue the settler colonial project. And it is only with a one state, a one democratic state of Palestinian and Jew living side by side, will we be able to see a genuine justice and peaceful process in Palestine. And if we have learned something else, it is that the Palestinians will continue to resist in the face of the greatest adversity against all the odds against all the might of Israel back to the hilt by Western powers, Palestinians still take to the streets in heroic numbers, but they cannot do so alone. We cannot leave them to fight alone. That means we have to fight here in Britain, but we also have to recognize as well that Israel is able to do what it can because of the acquiescence and the support of the regimes in the Middle East. The, 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 the Egyptian regime, the Turkish regime, sign deals with Israel, give them support and so on. We have to say that the road to Jerusalem lies through Cairo and that to see liberation for Palestinians, it, it requires a revolt here in Britain, but also in the Middle East as a whole. And I think if we've been having this meeting two weeks ago, talking about that might have seemed like quite an abstract thing. But again, because the Palestinians have forced themselves onto the world stage, through their agency, through their actions, they have raised some big, big questions and shown about how Palestine can be free. So I think our role is to build solidarity here in Britain, to understand what is happening politically, and to try and point to a solution that leads to real justice for Palestinians and, through people, and for people throughout the Middle East as a whole.